And hello, everyone out there. Uh, my name is Thomas Slid, and we're here with Mitchell Ag, who is uh, various various things. He's a writer in uh, several capacities, done a few short films. Uh, but today we're talking about his most recent book, um, Toei, The Only Way, in which he explores the question of why uh, young people do not tend to vote. He's coming out of England. I'm here in uh, the United States. Uh, so there's some distinctions. The phenomenon is a current in uh, both cases. Really, I would suspect it is almost global. Um, but I don't know. I looked very much into that question. But uh, just to turn it over uh, to you, Mitchell, uh, in terms of like introducing the book, you know, do you uh, how how would you go about opening the conversation there? Well, I would agree. Well, agree the problem it. of young, young people, people voting, voting probably is global. Um, but I think, especially in Britain and America, it's certainly a big deal. Now, um, the way you set it up in your book is uh, you, want, you, you say that you actually sort of identify sort of four broad uh, clusters of uh, causation as to, you know, why it is. So, you know, most people want to sort of chalk it up as uh, you say at one point to one thing or another but in fact it's a complicated phenomenon uh let me go ahead and sketch if you will uh, you maybe the four sort of uh, distinct moments there which contribute to this uh, issue that uh young people don't vote in it or don't tend to vote in significant numbers so in the book i break it up down to four Four main reasons. Um, the first reason, I put it down to corruption within politics and the scandals and the lies of politicians. So for an example, you have the 2009 expenses scandal in Britain, where you had MPs claiming £2,000 for their moats to be cleaned and £1,600 for a pond feature, £30,000 for gardening at the taxpayer's expense. And the expenses scandal was a major impact on the 2010 general election, where we saw a decrease in overall turnout, but especially young voters. Another example we saw today with Tony Blair was featured in numerous articles about the Iraq war and how he lied to us. It's not just Blair, it was Jack Straw, Dick Cheney, George Bush. And we know it was an illegal war. We know they lied to us about WMD and young people see these lies and this isn't just young people it's everyone every voter mm -hmm. they see the lies and they they don't see why they should vote for or even bother getting out the house to vote for people they don't trust people they see in scandals in the news every day and then you have people like Nick Clegg who completely lied in Britain about his stats on tuition fees and once he got a little bit of power he Announced all, all chances of uh, lowering tuition fees. So that's the first first reason. The second reason, I put it down to broken a broken system. So the electoral system in Britain and America, I guess most of the most of the Western world, is broken, and we all know it's broken. We know we we can only have one or two parties in power, but we do it anyway. But young people see past this because they're more idealistic. So what you have in Britain is you have an alternative, you have the alternative parties that have split the votes so much that you just have two parties, you have the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. And in America, it's, it's completely different. You just have two parties with no other party having a chance of getting in. So the young people see this and they don't see the point in voting for politicians if they're the ones they want in the alternative parties can't get any power. And it's not just the electoral system, it's the economic system, the capitalist system. So you have in Britain, you have over a million Brits using food banks every day. And that's in the fifth largest economy in the world. That's 
to me, that doesn't sound like a working economy. That sounds broken to me. Uh, you have, where well, you have a system where multi-billion pound companies can get away with tax evasion. Companies like Facebook, who paid less tax than the average Brit did last year. You have rich individuals, including the Prime Minister, whose, whose wealth, whose family wealth is offshore in the Channel Islands. I don't think that's very fair. I don't think that's. I don't think that's a. I don't think that's a fixed system. And then you have, in America, not a single banker was jailed for the subprime mortgage crisis, and leading on to the recession, which affected everyone's lives. And yet, you have young African American men who have been forced into lives of poverty and crime because of the broken system who are incarcerated for smoking a bit of weed or being caught up in gang crime. That's not, a, that's not a working system to me. And young people see that and they don't want to vote. They don't see why they should vote for a working system, for a broken system, if this doesn't work for the young people in society. So the third reason is, is lack of knowledge. In Britain, I don't know about America, but in Britain, politics isn't taught at all in schools. I think there's a real problem with uh, politics not being taught. We have children who don't know the difference between certain types of tax. They don't know what different parties stand for. They wouldn't know how to vote. They wouldn't know how to have, how different policies affected them, even if they did vote. So that's certainly if they don't if they don't know how to vote, they're not going to vote in the first place, are they? And the fourth reason, I, I think this is the main reason, the most important reason, is just honest obliviousness and complete neutrality on the subject. And I think this is a generational thing, but it's more than that. I, I've come up with a theory which I expand on in the book. I call it Blair's children. Or it can work for Bushes or Clintons or Browns, Camerons. What it is, is the current generation of 18 to 24 year olds who are the young voters of today, including myself. They haven't lived in a world, we haven't lived in a world without things like the World Wide Web, mobile phones, games consoles, instant messaging. They've lived through this this digital advancement never seen on this never seen before on this uh, on this um think of the word. Yeah, they've never seen this advancement in technology. Yeah. So why would, uh, say, an 18-year-old woman from Chester, why would she want to sit down in the living room with her family and talk about, have a, de have a civilised debate about the Syrian refugee crisis? Why would she want to do that when she can be probably upstairs in a room watching television that, sh that represents her, that she can connect with, whilst communicating with her friends via social media, instant messaging, and have a good time. Why would she want to do the first? I don't see a reason why she would. And this isn't, this isn't down to young people. There's no apathy. This is complete neutrality on the part of the young people because of politics. And politics hasn't synergized with technology whatsoever it's been left behind in its little bubble and young people of today have put politics to the top shelf put back to the, the back of the wardrobe and they just they haven't they're not going to it's not going to enter their sphere because it doesn't interest them at all through complete neutrality so they're the four main reasons why i think young people don't vote so it's interesting there's lots of things you know we can go on from there what strikes me is that I'm sorry. Did you say something? No. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, is that sort of by uh, reflecting or emphasizing that there's a kind of obliviousness, which you distinguish from apathy, in that if someone is um, apathetic, uh, that would suggest that at some point there is a significant degree of emotional commitment 
which is uh, stymied, broken, or in any event, uh, it, it, there is a past which led to this uh, separation, um, which is then manifested in the apathy and in action, which follows uh, that. Whereas when if someone is simply uninterested, you know, then, you know, such as <clears throat> one may not have a particular concern as to, you know, going on and, you know, the Alpha Centauri uh, region of the the universe, because you have, you know, there's no, it's no there's no, there's no connection there uh, between what's happening. Yeah, in, like, yeah. You know, it's just it doesn't even register. Um, uh, and what I think compelling about that remark is it indicates that other causes to which you alluded, right, the corruption of the system, brokenness and a sense of ignorance or ill understanding as to how to engage with it. You can't get to any of those other things, which have, you know, integral uh, roles to play in what's wrong with the current impasse if you're not even beginning to consider the sphere of politics in general in virtue of the obliviousness to which you've alluded. And um, so the thesis I'm, I'm hearing you offer, and then you can elaborate and tell me if, this is correct or not, is that, you know, among the various suggestions which you posit, which are several in the book, as to how one uh, can begin to address the issue, uh, one is that, and you already sort of alluded to this a moment ago, is that you need to find a way to interface technology uh, with the political sphere, and hopefully by doing so, create uh, an avenue which will then enable the, uh, at least the level of awareness, which hopefully will turn into engagement. Um, yeah, that's, that's completely right. So this generation needs some sort of technological advancement in, within politics to, to spark an interest in the topic. Because if you don't, it's just going to keep, keep going and, Young voter turnout will will continue to decline. So, what I'm wondering is, or, or I mean, maybe you, could you give um, more specific notions as to how I might do that? You give some, in the so, book, but yeah. So, the things I come up with, and I think are opinions that are being played around with a lot things like online voting online voting would 100 percent get young people to vote if they had some sort of interest so if you told a young person you have to go and leave your house and go to your nearest church or community center you have to get a piece of paper and tick a box and then you voted whereas if you told a young person right go on the internet and enter this web address and choose choose your candidate there. I think I think it's a bit obvious which the young person would choose. So that's one option you could do. Another option you could use you could integrate it with social media. We've already seen in Britain and I guess in America as well. Uh, every at least ma the majority of MPs have social media accounts on Twitter and Facebook. That is to connect with their constituents, but it could be, it could be used a lot more to get young people interested in the first place. Because if young people see a politician retweeted on their timeline on Twitter, for example, they might spark, that might spark an interest if they're talking about topics that they never thought politicians would talk about. So there are just two things that you could talk, you could that would integrate technology and politics. But the, the certain things such as the, the, House, the House, of, uh, House of Commons, Congress, if you integrated technology within that, within, say, the voting system in, inside, especially the House of Commons, which is very archaic, it's more of a caucus system, um, I think young people would find that a lot more interesting than just seeing men in suits enter two separate chambers. 
And considering, if you consider uh, elections, especially in America at the moment, they have numerous television debates. There seems to be a television debate uh, for every primary. In Britain, we've only we only had I think five at the last election, and they were very well received. If there were far more, in comparison with America, I think that would get the young people of Britain to vote. Problems that arise is that there's it's kind of a like the double-edged sword. Um, for example, uh, to start with the last thing, you know, the television debate, and I here in the U.S. but they really serve, um, in my view, uh, as much as a principle of exclusion as inclusion. Because there's uh, you know some relatively draconian mechanisms in place to exclude uh, third uh, party candidates, um, you know such as Jill Stein of the Green Party, and you know socialist candidates and libertarian candidates and other you know there are actually as I'm sure you're aware uh, more than two parties in the United States. So you can probably um, and even within the Democratic the Republican parties, the uh, people get excluded if they're not um, uh, good standing with uh, the party establishment. In fact, you know some efforts have been made to undercut Bernie Sanders, and his uh, success has been something of an embarrassment for uh, the DNC uh, establishment and the challenge that he's posing to Hillary Clinton. Which to invoke his name is to you know bring up the other side of the coin uh, with respect to um, power of technology because I think a, a fairly persuasive argument could be made that his ascendancy, his success, can be connected with the consequence of the internet, right? That you know his campaign, which is funded largely small donations, um, I think derives a lot of his momentum. Precisely from interface on social media and so forth. Uh, so there's an ambiguity there. There's an ambiguity. Um, the other ambiguity. <laughs> where am I going? I should I should draw this all to like a a question. I'm sorry. I'm uh, rambling a bit. Uh, to draw it to a question, though. It will must be this. That ultimately, technology is a means, and it can obviously be a means used in one direction or another. But how does one uh, handle the question of who controls the means? I guess that's what I would ask you, uh, Mitchell, because it seems that it would be possible for technology to be invoked in a manner which could stimulate interest of uh, the younger generation, but perhaps in a problematic manner, depending on who is pulling the strings, if you will. Yes, I completely agree. With the BBC, for instance, it's supposed to be some sort of democratic organisation funded by the taxpayer. But then you have parties such as UKIP and the Greens who distrust the BBC a lot, with the Greens, the Green Party were excluded from numerous debates and will be excluded and have, haven't been given airtime for polit party political broadcasts this year, whereas parties with fewer members have been, and whereas UKIP have some sort of hatred towards the BBC because of political bias. and. That's an organisation that's meant to be completely neutral with funded by the public and yet it still fails to maintain a neutral stance as far as those two parties are concerned. So the question you ask is very, is very difficult to answer because even if you have a publicly funded organisation such as the BBC, it's still not going to be neutral and the problems which you suggest will always happen. But it just has to 
you just have to include democracy in every step, I guess. Right, and uh, so, I mean, it's it's a sticky work. There's just, I mean, it, it's one of those things where you like you feel. There's, there's just, you know, almost no way around it. Um, but so you come back to the question of obliviousness, right? Which, in a sense, you have to address this, right? It's not enough to have the politicians, you know, have their Twitter accounts and so forth. Um, they also actually have to sort of engage effectively. Uh, so it's a great issue of, you know, who's at the background of like the technology for the moment. Let's come back to this issue of how you engage young people. If you introduce, you know, avenues for doing that, you know, how do you speak to them effectively? Uh, and this may in fact actually relate back to the question of corruption. And uh, I think it might also connect with the connection of class. Because how do people in the political class actually enter into a conversation with people who are largely excluded from it? So I think it question? starts with, yeah, I think it starts with political education. I think if you teach young people at an early age and you set the, you set the spark alight of politics, and you tell young people that, look, this will affect you. This is what it means to do this. This is what each thing means. That's the beginning, especially with young children who are um, who have a sponge-like memory and intuition. Um, this will this will move them on to maybe have an interest within with politics. So there are companies in Britain such as Bite the Ballot who go around schools and teach young people of all social standings what about politics and they do it in a way which isn't black and white, which isn't grey men in suits and ancient voting rituals. It's, it's up to date and it's engaging. And if they have this understanding from an early age, they might go on and the interest might might be there when they grow up. So, um, how, well, I was about to ask you, how would, you know, you say we could go about, how would one go about doing this? I mean, you, you cited this particular company, uh, right, the ballot, uh, they're not the only initiative in this respect. Uh, there's similar initiatives here in the U.S. Get out the vote, and so forth. Um, so what you want is to say like an expansion of these sorts of organizations, right? And they are essentially. Uh, I don't know if private's quite the right word because at least here, I mean, maybe it's different. England, but when, uh, depending on the language, right? Uh, the private, when you say private here in the US, it has a connotation of um, profit orientation, but that's not really what you mean. You simply mean that there is not a formal governmental affiliation. Is that correct? That's correct. It's not on the curriculum. Uh, so, um, how would one encourage the proliferation of those sorts of organizations, in your view? See, that's the thing, isn't it? You need, if you want to get young people to vote and you want to get young people to know how to vote, you have to teach them. However, it's not in the establishment's interest to teach young people because they know young people don't vote in the first place. And the establishment, i.e. the Conservative Party, Labour Party, Republicans and Democrats, they, they are in. They are in the. They are only interested in who's going to vote for them. So, especially for the Conservative Party in Britain, where they have the highest proportion of older voters, they look after the older voters because they want their votes. They know the young people don't vote for the Conservative Party, and therefore 
won't do any any slight reform to get young people to vote and will not introduce politics into the curriculum. See, so this, this get, way... Sorry. Sorry, go on. I was just saying, to get young people to vote in the first place and to get, uh, get politics onto the curriculum, it won't be in their interest at all. And it just, uh, it's, very, it's a very tricky subject to even bring up because it effectively can't happen without they're doing so, and a conservative education secretary. So, um, there's like two points here, right? Um, and then this connects back again to the issue of obliviousness, where I, I just want to say, say explicitly, my position is that this obliviousness is not altogether an accident, but it is in a non trivial being consciously encouraged, cultivated the outcome of certain processes. Um, it's not, and, and even though it's sort of felt with a greater acuity of late, uh, perhaps with the ascendancy of this uh, technologically, this digitally saturated uh, generation, it's the sort of thing that has a history, I would say, reaching back even to um, the 19th century. And and I think it connects actually intimately with certain imperatives that arise under um, capitalist dispensations, where in order to have an effectively pliant uh, labor force, you have to um, funnel their mentality along certain narrow avenues Otherwise, well, I was the human instinct for freedom and equity uh, will uh, perhaps create more friction than the machine of capitalism would uh, like to uh, something. Um, so that I mean, that's that's my position, roughly speaking. I mean, where do you where do you stand? Do you think the obliviousness is an accident, or is it a consequence of? certain structural features or, or where do you stand on, on what I'm getting at there? No, I don't think it's an accident. I think it's been encouraged by the technical, technological advancement, but no, I don't think it's an accident. I think, like you said, and the working class and the young of, are basically the working class because they don't have any disposable income. They're not the ones looked after by the establishment. And the obliviousness is uh, cultivated by the establishment in order to sorry, sorry, uh, in order to make sure they don't vote. So, and by the way, uh, we should clarify um, and, uh, just. Um, for a broader audience, um, England, right? Or what is Eton? You know, because a lot of people may not know uh, Eton. You know, it's a school, but it sort of stands for more than a school. It's probably sort of analogous to, say, like Harvard and Yale here in the U.S. But can you go ahead and uh, it, uh, just search all that out? So Eton is one of the top, if not the top, private school. So we have to pay for effectively. Uh, in in the United Kingdom, and it's attended by, it's been attended by David Cameron, uh, the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, the current candidate for Mayor of the Conservative Party, Zach Goldsmith, um, the Chancellor of, of the United Kingdom, George Osborne. So all these Conservative uh, members of Parliament went to this prestigious school, and the Eton way of life is this pompous, middle to upper class uh, education and outlook that they are the, the social elites and they thrive on this free capitalist system of social Darwinism and the working class are simply cogs in a machine. That's how I define what Eton is. So what well, you're really talking about, oh, I shouldn't say, like, what one is really talking about then 
the, perhaps this is why you think we really need to uh, grow um, or turn out, in a, uh, especially among the young, isn't so much challenging the, the formality of the system, but the fact of um, a certain class dominance, right? Uh, that there's a there's a certain that's that's what needs to be challenged, it's, and it's not even it's because it's just not a way for human beings to live with each other. You know, be living in a space, radical egality, if you like, equality. And when you're ensconced in a society where, um, by definition, some people are going to be funneled to privilege at the expense of the great many, uh, the, 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 that egality, that equality is, is barely going to get off the ground. And also just nastiness. And, and ugliness and just, you know, rises as a result. Um, what do you say about the idea of directly challenging the system you know, head on, right? Starting to form a different kind of culture or society within it. Um, actually, the two processes aren't, you know, mutually exclusive, right? You can do them both sort of in parallel. But, you know... Uh, maybe another way of asking the question is, what do you think are other forms of political engagement besides for voting, which also should uh, perhaps be encouraged? So I take the position that v there are no other forms of politics. I think voting is the only way to change things because you see protests and they don't work you have the nine you had 1984 minor strike which went on for a year in Britain under thatcher and at the end of it you had the closure of coal mines and the death of hundreds of miners because they didn't have enough money to eat you have the 2002-2003 iraq war protest of over 3 million people, which still led to the Iraq war. You have currently in Britain, the junior doctor strike, which has led to the, the health secretary, Jeremy Hunt, enforcing a, a contract on the junior doctors, even though they have been on strike. I don't think protest works as much as it's a form of political engagement, which should be encouraged because it gets people talking. I don't think it's a means of changing things. I think it opens up political discussion, but it doesn't effectively change anything. Well, it's, it's certainly not the end. It's the beginning. Um, I must confess, I was, I was taken somewhat aback by your um, bare stance that the voting is the only uh, effective means of political engagement um, for a few different reasons. Uh, one being that uh, could not one possibly argue that you are uh, tacitly giving power away to the very system which creates these horrendous situations that you just enumerated, you know, voting in a way gives consent to people. Like Margaret Thatcher, and, and you know, or Ronald Reagan, you know, and all these people who you know tempt me to uh, invoke obscene language. Uh, and, and 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 in as far as that the case, you know, I've got to say that, that there's some other. There's got to be other options on the table. Just choosing which of these, which of these individuals you're you're going to empower, you know. Um, I suppose to anticipate your response, it comes down to the candidates that are going to be entering the system. Is, is that is that what you would suggest, or I don't I don't want to put words in your mouth. But, uh, so is that is that the line that you would take, or the way I see it? is the establishment will always vote. You can tell, like, 
for instance, Russell Brand told people not to vote, but the establishment will always vote. They, just because the majority will not, and in, I think it's something like 44% didn't vote in the last election. Just because 44% of people, 50% of people don't vote, it won't stop them from voting. The system will still be there and it will still be working for them. So in order to make an impact, you need to vote. You don't, I don't see any other way around it. It's wicked because, uh, they're phrased too much today, but, um, I just, uh, I don't. I don't have an initial response. I, I mean, the, the problem you raise is a significant problem, obviously, right? Um, until people vote en masse, and you know, the numbers, you know, show consistently that um, <laughs> that if people actually did vote, right, they, we'd be dealing with a very different political landscape, right? You know, I'm sure that's true in Britain as it is in the U.S. If like you look at people's actual opinions, whether it be on candidates or on issues, um, it's actually sort of astonishing the uh, divergence between the the view of the general public and the the the, the, the positions taken by the, the the governing body. Like, for example, in the Iraq War, which was obviously unpopular. You know, but we went ahead and did Vietnam, you know, to reach back, right, you know. <laughs> the world's been burning since it's been turning. Um oh, I just uh, I guess for what I'm reaching is a way take power away from these overarching uh, establishments, you know. Um, I think that there's some hope. And what, what, what do you think about this? If we sort of recenter where a real sort of political weight resides uh, on a more local scale, on say a more municipal scale, if we start to re empower municipalities and smaller districts to uh, take away from uh, the overarching power of in the U.S. case of federal, you know, or, you know, I don't know what the appropriate analog uh, word is, you know, uh, for, for the U.K. system, right? But I think you get what I'm, uh, what I'm getting. So what do you think about that? I think ultimately devolution is a good thing. Uh, the more democracy we have at a local level, the better, because it does take the power away from the elites at the top. However, it goes back to the establishment. Well, it's not in their interest. It's not in their interest to change things because they might be out of a job. They might be. They might lose. They, their tax bracket might go up. It's not in their interest to change things for the people. Right. So, I mean, I guess you sort of like implicit in your remarks is the just sort of supposition that the establishment is here to stay. Yeah. Um, how would one, how would one go about challenging that premise? Well, you need candidates such as Bernie Sanders in the States and Jeremy Corbyn in the UK. What do you Can candidates who Sorry. challenge the establishment? you think about uh, Corbyn's uh, ascendancy there? Uh, you know, what, what do you think we can expect from that? So I'm a supporter of Jeremy Corbyn. Um, he's an honest politician, if not sometimes too honest. And I think he speaks for the people. However, the media in Britain, the right-wing media, owned by Rupert Murdoch, the majority of it is, um, have some sort of game against him because he's not part of the gang, he's not the establishment. And Jeremy Corbyn's um, popularity seems to be on the decrease because of media attacks. 
but ultimately he speaks for the majority of the people so if they if the people weren't so drawn in by publications such as the sun uh, the times telegraph daily mail then perhaps Jeremy Corbyn's support might be more. And I think if you speak to the average Brit, their views would be more in line with Jeremy Corbyn's than they would David Cameron's. But because of the propaganda and the media attacks, they see certain things and they don't choose to support Jeremy Corbyn. So there's one other issue uh, raised in the book um just to bring this up here um oh and you know i mean before i raise that um just to sort of follow up on what you just said there it's um i guess the point is that you can't rely on just putting single person into power in a favorable position Right, you really need an ensemble um, because, and just you know, even as PM, it's not like Jeremy Corbyn's all powerful, or even if someone like you know, Bernie Sanders or you know Jill Stein or somebody like that were to ascend to the presidency, what would probably happen is that they would just be you know uh, cut off from uh, effectively attaining anything. So that almost sort of translates into a discussion of like how do you create a more effective party politic right? so that you're not just pushing uh, one person into power because they're not going to be adequate to challenge things, right? Um, would you say that's fair? And uh, The problem is, um, me personally, I dislike party politics because becomes more of a, a football game and you get politicians who just toe the party line who are just whipped into line and they will say and agree with whatever the leader says and if you if you revert that to having all all members the same as the leader you agree with so in this case Jeremy Corbyn and you have all socialist uh, MPs that's not going to be that I'll this, I'll just feel how the people who supported David Cameron will feel, and it's it's just going. It just it seems to be it's okay for you. It's okay for me, sort of game. Right. I mean, and I'm actually pretty much on the same page with you there, Mitchell. That's the problem with with you know with any kind of collective framework. The the whenever the collective surprise, you know the position of the individual, which is uh, the answer to that is sort of more radical democracy where every individual is engaging and not just blocks of individuals. Uh, perhaps there's some kind of nuanced middle ground at which we could arrive. Um, we can maybe return to that. But I also was going to ask you to bring up this issue of uh, the celebrity, the role of celebrity in the popular imagination and leveraging that role as a strategy or perhaps a tactic to encourage voter turnout. And, um, you know, you, you cite uh, Russell Band in particular, but why don't you just talk about that, that topic, that question? So to me, Russell Brand uh, completely changed my political journey. So prior to any of the trues or his book the Re uh, revolution i was a i was a voted conservative at the european and local elections however after the power of his youtube videos and his writing i changed completely and now i'm i guess as left wing as he is um i think the power of the celebrity is massive you only have to look at american endorsements for someone like Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders. And those endorsements mean something because those celebrities have followers. And if people see these followers endorsing candidates, they think, yeah, I like this person. I'll, I'll 
go I'll vote the same way he's voting or she's voting. So I think the power of celebrity is that's something needed, and it, especially for young people who are more inclined to follow celebrities and to idolize celebrities. They are certainly some, something that can be done to get young people interested in politics. It is, of course, sort of a, um, carries a kind of dangerous ambigu ambiguity with it, though, right? Because, uh, precisely because it sort of feeds into the notion of um, a, almost a cult of personality. That might be too strong of a word, but where people's uh, affiliations simply follow from their uh, interest in a particular individual, you know, um, it's it's perhaps you know superficial um but you know could it possibly also backfire and, and and discourage you know sort of like real engagement on the part of the individual where you know they start towing the celebrity line in a way tantamount to a party line in in in, a, in an easily manipulable manner how do you how do you reply to that uh, difficulty no, I think it could. Um, so we go back to Russell Brand. Before the 2015 general election, he interviewed Ed Miliband and in fact endorsed Ed Miliband by the end. And many commentators said that Russell Brand was at fault for losing the election for the Labour Party. I don't necessarily agree with that. But you also have people like the actress Emma Thompson who spoke on the subject of the European referendum and called Britain something like a soggy grey island. And that had a terrible effect for the for the in campaign because they saw this and they thought it was a negative comment. Right. You know, and I mean in the US um we have this sort of thing here in the U.S. Uh, last night they had the Oscars, and there is a controversy this year over um, the lack of black nominees uh, in the best acting categories and uh, a certain block of um, celebrities boycotted the Oscars as a consequence. Um, the controversy, you know, sort of is good uh, in that it gets people to think about it. Um, but then when you look at the remarks of uh, Chris Rock, um, well, <laughs> they weren't exactly coherent, but they, they, they provided a kind of uh, almost like an apology and a blanket saying, well, all these people – boycotting or they're, they're just ridiculous and they're making much ado about nothing and uh, you know they're not like appreciating they should just serve I don't, I don't want to say too much because I don't want to speak out of turn and misrepresent uh, Chris Rock's statements needless to say uh, what they serve to do was um, misrepresent the people who are boy were doing the boycott and suggesting that they were being infantile instead of suggesting that they were trying to create like, where by to open the conversation to look at other issues of the you know broad based oppression of African Americans here in the U.S. through the prison industrial complex, et cetera. So, uh, but because he's a celebrity and all those celebrities are there with their, you know, their glitz and their glamour, all of a sudden now everybody feels like it's okay, you know, oh, don't pay attention to the boycotters or whatever. Not that that particular boycott was of that great a moment because it suffers from the same contradictions of celebrity that reside in the Oscars themselves. But uh, I guess to your point, um, for better or for worse in our culture, Celebrity serves a significant mediating function. And so probably a role to be played in harnessing that function for the purpose of encouraging broader based political engagement. Is that fair? Yes, I would agree with that. <laughs>
I think young I think young people and celebrities connect on a level that celebrities don't connect with adults and they play an important role in in life I guess not just politics why, why do you think that is why do I think celebrities play an important role or why is it do you think that the, the young your people tend to sort of resonate with them. I mean, it I might just, just be... Young... Go on. Sorry. So I, I think young people are... They're naturally more idealistic. They're more... They, they haven't found who they are yet. And they follow celebrities because it gives them some sort of goal to, walk, to work towards... Um, and they can idolize them, whereas adults or older people seem not to care as much about who they are. They've they they found themselves, so to speak, and they don't need to reach out to people they don't know and idolize them as much as young people. And it also gives young people a a comfort to know that there are these people that make them happy. Where at a time it could be it can be a hard time growing up as a young person, especially in today's climate. It's a thoughtful. I suppose I've been fortunate in my own life not to have had to be unduly reliant on some focus like that. But um, it it does say something about our culture these days that people apparently have a need psychologically to, uh, to to connect with someone uh, like a celebrity in order to, you know, help in the formation of their identity. Um, so, and I, I guess there's, there's, there's positive aspects to that, you know, the notion of the hero or the heroine. So um, it's certainly uh, something perhaps to which I should, or upon which I should meditate at a, at a greater length. So, well, look, uh, Mitchell, we've, we've been talking for coming up an hour here, uh, more or less, I think. I'm not, I'm not tracking it that closely. Uh, but uh, we're going to start wrapping it up. Let me ask, let me just sort of open the table, you know, what would you like to say that hasn't been said, or is there any, any remarks that you would like to offer as we sort of conclude conversation well i think ultimately we all agree that young people need to vote and there's a big problem and to deal with that we need to look at our institutions our schools and our our parliamentary uh institutions and they need reform and to do that, we need to vote. So it ultimately comes down to getting our young children voting and interested in politics from an early age. Well, thank you, Mitchell. And, um, we'll have this up here. Within the next few hours, it'll be up on YouTube, and I'll send you the links and all that. And uh, you can go and... Check out Mitchell's book, Toby, The Only Way is Eaten, in which he goes into all this stuff at uh, considerable, the greater length, and uh, did a good deal of research, sort of ground his uh, position. Uh, and you can also check out his blog. I put it here in the messages on the right, mitchellag.com. Um, so thanks again. And, well, thank uh, you. I'll talk to you soon. So, no, thank you. Now. Goodbye. Bye-bye.